Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CMA and SEMA weekly webinar series, and happy Friday. I am Jackie Lewis, the VP of Content here at the CMA. And today we have a fantastic expert panel lined up to discuss how they are keeping up with consumer trends and some in uncertain times that we are currently in, um, in retail. So our panel is gonna be moderated today by Susie's Chief Customer Officer, Katie Gross, with special guest Pearl Park, Senior Manager of Strategic Capabilities and Omni Insights at J&J. Uh, &J and Yelena Idelchik, Director of Shopper Insights for Reckitt, who is also a uh, personal friend of mine and a member of our SEMA board. And so we are thrilled to have uh, quite a great group of experts here to discuss uh, expectations for fall 2022 shopping, navigating ongoing inflation and supply chain challenges, and more topics. So all very hot topics of the day in retail. Uh, please feel free to enter questions at any point uh, for either uh, any of the ladies on the line during the discussion. In the chat box in the upper right hand corner of your screen and Katie is going to weave those into the conversation as they come in so feel free at any point to enter them don't save them for the end and then finally a copy of the recording is also going to be available to all CMA and SEMA members that registered as well as in our resource library on demand early next week and we will send everyone an email with that link to the replay as well if you missed something so without further ado I'm going to hand it over to Katie Thank you so much, Jackie, and hi, everyone. Welcome to Insight 2022, how Johnson & Johnson and Reckitt are keeping up with consumer trends in uncertain times. Um, as Jackie mentioned, I'm Katie Gross, and I work for here at Suzy. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with Suzy, we are an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that integrates quant, qual, and high-quality audiences into a single connected research cloud. And I'm really excited to, to uh, welcome you to today's discussion with Pearl and with Elena. And today's discussion is unique in that both Yelena and Pearl and I have spoken um, in the past, not together. So I'm actually excited to bring them together as well. We're gonna revisit some of the past chats we've had, dive into some new ones over the next hour. And of course, um, as Jackie mentioned, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm gonna be monitoring it on the side here. Um, I'm gonna weave in as I can and answer some at the end as well. So let's kick things off. Let's get to know each other a little bit better. Pearl, let's start with you. We'd love to kind of hear a little bit more about your background um, and your role at J&J. &J. Awesome, thank you so much for having me again. Um, happy Friday, everybody. Um, and thanks for joining. I know this is a, a big vacation week and, and we do have some summer Fridays going on. So thanks for joining. And so again, a senior manager of strategic capabilities and Omni Insights for J&J. &J. Uh, my team and I uh, manage across multiple customers in three key areas, one being data automation. Um, secondly, we also manage tools that help us navigate digital and brick and mortar shelf. And lastly, around on-demand insights tools such as Suzy. Fantastic, awesome. And Yelena, I would love to kind of hear a little bit more with the audience uh, about your background and your role today. Thank you. Uh, I'm Yelena Idelchik. I'm the Director of Shopper Insights at Racket, uh, covering the U.S. market across 10 of our categories. Uh, we are focused on hygiene, health, and infant nutrition um, uh, pillars. Uh, I have been with Racket for almost 15 years, and Shopper Insights has definitely been a passion and the role that we have developed at Racket pretty strongly to be able to support both internal and external customers. Fantastic. All right. Excited to dive in. So as mentioned a few minutes ago, you've both joined us on chats like this previously. Pearl, you were part of our program back in March. And Yelena, you and I spoke many times in 2021. Um, and I'm excited to see how things have changed for your companies recently. So let's obviously start um, with the topic that's on everyone's mind, um, inflation. But Yelena, would love to hear from you. How's it going over at Racket? And how have you been navigating consumer sentiment during this time? Uh, yes, absolutely. So first of all, let me just say that the only thing that is constant right now is change. And arguably, there are much more frequent and intense changes that were happening right now. Um, inflation is definitely real. We all know it. We all live it. And in fact, it's uh, the concern that shoppers uh, have to a significant extent. In fact, the uh, concern for inflation is three and a half times higher than that of COVID right now. And one in two shoppers are uncomfortable with their finances. So just think about that for a second. So we're navigating this in several ways. 
on the corporate level, the key is not just focusing on price, but naturally on value we bring to our consumers. So efficacy of our formulas, for example, like the one for Lysol, uh, being able to be in full supply for back to school for Lysol wipes and disinfecting sprays to ensure parents feel their kids are safe. Uh, new scents that we uh, uh, that might appeal to millennials, for example, new value sizes so that shoppers feel they're getting enough uh, for their buck and also do not have to drive to the store as frequently. In fact, this factor has been uh, really growing in importance in the last couple of months. And on the research side, we have realized that we need to constantly monitor shopper behavior and sentiment. So we have created monthly research uh, trackers to listen and track uh, specific shopper behaviors. This allows us to pivot and keep our internal and external teams informed. Yeah. Great point. Um, and yeah, particularly for Lysol wipes, as you mentioned, with back to school coming up, we actually hosted a, a back to school webinar um, just last week and parents are very concerned about um, school safety um, and not just the spend they have to make for sure. Pearl, over to you. How are you using insights on cash insights management, on cash management, management thing, um, to stay on top, uh, of stay on top of information? Yeah, so particularly when it comes to the category management side, um, I would say it's continuous tracking and monitoring not just about price, but how it impacts categories differently. And in a lot of cases, we see a lot of retail variants. So um, although, you know, whether or not we are in a recession, uh, we are definitely in a discretionary spend recession. So we see tremendous variants across different brands and categories. Um, what I would say, and, and I referred to this back in March, when it comes to tracking price, I think it's incredibly important that you have tools and use tools that really can help you decompose what is actually driven by price because it's just an incredibly volatile time with supply, a lot of the macro trends, COVID, et cetera. So again, we use a lot of tools that help us do that. Um, in addition, we look at promo strategies, right? So promo strategies are definitely changing to combat price. Uh, we look at price graphs across different products. We look at downstreaming from premium. And in some cases, we also look at trade up, right? Um, just due to that value equation changing. So a lot of different ways to track inflation in Catman. Um, and again, it's just continuous because everyone's experienced it, but at varying degrees. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and you quite rightly mentioned whether we're in whether or not we're in a recession. I know the definitions keep changing at the moment, but it's definitely a discretionary spend recession. So I love that kind of phrase you use there. Um, we also heard from a lot of clients that um, the consumers are having to make some really tough choices in their basket. Some items are being voted out of the basket. Others are winning in their place. Personal tip from me, avocados have become incredibly expensive. So I'm replacing avocado in my salad with cottage cheese to get that kind of similar texture so there's certainly some times where we could be winning in the shopper basket as well how would you say that the shopper journey has really kind of changed this year um and obviously it goes beyond just the shopper basket and pearl we'll start with you yeah i definitely see gas prices impacting how shoppers are making choices about the number of trips they're making and also retailer selection right so you know, we all know that it's really high, but it's really impacting that trip. Also, just in general with inflation, deal seeking, right? So deal seeking has become incredibly important prior to that trip. So having the um, content that's available, coupons, any type of promotions available digitally has become much more important now more than ever. And I would also say from, um, uh, we see some recent trends when it comes to different retailers. So when you combine a great in-store experience um, with increased prices online that happen either through last style delivery of charges and or just general online prices that are more, we do see some shift back to traditional brick and mortar. Um, but this, again, varies a lot by retailer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Anulator, what are your thoughts on the, the shopper journey? I completely agree with Pearl. And just to actually build on what she has been saying is, we also see that we're now living in a saving, not the spending economy. And uh, shoppers are choiceful as to what they buy and how they make their decisions. 
So for example, we saw that the average basket year to date and in July went up 18% versus uh, 2019, but the average salary that people are making only went up about 5%. So when we do the math, this means that shoppers have to dip into their savings to stay afloat quite a bit. And the mm -hmm. savings level, just to put things in perspective for an average American household is now 4%, and it used to be 6% on average pretty consistently for a while, even peaking as high as 15% uh, during the uh, peak of COVID. And as a result, credit card debt is going up again. So it is about promotions and value all around. But to also build again on what Pearl was saying, also uh, offering our shoppers the solutions for their everyday needs, something that they can see and understand and can feel that they're being more frugal about. Yeah, thank you. And that's really great data. So thank you so much there. Um, we recently posted a back to school webinar where we learned a lot about parents and their concerns and they weren't as concerned about um, back to school prices um, as the, kind of the headlines would have us uh, suggest. The headlines were really saying that parents are only going to spend on necessities. Um, however, our clients in Crayola and Walmart that were on the webinar with us really dug deep. They spoke to consumers, did the research and consumers definition of necessities had really hugely increased to include lip balms and breath strips and ninth grade makeup and so on and an increase spent on clothing so kind of the headlines are stating um you know necessities are what consumers are focused on but are you seeing differences between the media coverage around inflation versus the categories um that you, that you work within and, and really what you're seeing there and elena we'll start with you uh, sure. Uh, so we have not uh, seen the direct coverage uh, for some of these, uh, but just, you know, some of the key points that I want to make um, uh, in, in terms of value seeking and just overall behavior recently. So um, let's talk a little bit about cooking and dish care, for example, because, of course, Finnish is one of our brands. So the number one spend uh, item that people are cutting on is going to restaurants. Yet with Labor Day coming and July 4th behind us, people are getting together and cooking. People are also cooking at home more. We have uh, seen the dish category be very stable and uh, in some instances increasing, in fact. And when you compare the share of stomach uh, in terms of people's behavior, 61% of people are now cooking at home. And that is the statistic for the month of July. And it's an increase from 52% in June, for example. And when it comes to a share of stomach in the restaurants, it's only about 26% and has been declining. Let's take a look at another item uh, or another category rather. We know that people are not buying big ticket items like they did in the peak of COVID. Mm -hmm. So the long furniture, the big TVs are just not in high demand right now. Even home sales are down 6% in July. Yet people are cocooning more at home and they still want to decorate except that they want to do it on the budget. So air care, like air wick scented oils, for example, are still doing very well. Uh, these are the discretionary items people can afford and still choose not to live without. Just because inflation is all the rage, people still want to feel happy and in control. And speaking of control, uh, your back to school webinar recently uh, really uh, resonated with me and it clearly stated that the two concerns shoppers have are their kids' school safety and COVID safety, 50% more than inflation. So keeping kids uh, germ free is still top of mind and in fact, Germ concern overall is still top of mind for 25% of the US population, while vitamins are the number one choice for health defense over the last year. So our categories um, give the control uh, of their health and uh, the control of their health back to the shoppers. Yeah, absolutely. Some really great data. Thank you for sharing that as well. And personally, I cannot wait for cooking all those apple pies um, coming up. I cannot wait for all of the apple pie scented Airwick oils. And so, yeah, my my cocooning at home is definitely gonna get a spruce using a lot of your products in the next couple of uh, months here. Thinking about supply chain. So we're hearing more and more about the kind of supply chain issues that we were seeing are really leveling off. Um, I was just reading this morning, actually, in the morning brew, shout out to friend of Susie, Alex Lieberman, that Cisco, for example, had its best stock market day since 2020 after it announced that its supply chain snags have finally eased up um, completely. 
is in-store and online availability still a hot topic for consumers, um, Yelena? Uh, yes, it is, but uh, a little bit less so. So availability, uh, especially for cleaning products, for household products overall, is still a number two key driver just behind, you know, overall price. Um, uh, which is top of mind for everybody but we have seen a lot more inventory in the stores so arguably when people see inventory on shelf for, the, for, for a couple of months straight the fears are easing off and when they go and shop for back to school for example and they see inventory the fears are easing off so uh, yes still there are certain categories of course that are still out of stock but SKU simplification in the last uh, couple of months um, and some uh, product rationalization at least ensures that the top sellers are here to stay. Yep, great to hear. Um, all right, so moving on to a focus more kind of generally on consumer trends as a whole as we come out of those summer months. Elena, I'm curious, uh, what trends are you seeing when it comes to cleaning supplies and how consumers are interacting with those cleaning products um, when it comes to kind of where we are with COVID 2022? Uh, sure. So remarkably, the consumption has remained very stable and uh, the consumption levels have been elevated to arguably a new normal versus uh, uh, 2018 and 2019. So, of course, we saw huge spikes in 2020, but then it leveled off, except that, of course, it leveled off to a new higher base level, both in units and naturally dollars. However, the level of cleaning has tamed as shoppers are simply fatigued from being worried all the time. Still, the important uh, note is that uh, one in five is using cleaners more frequently, even in the last three months, um, as we track this data um, on a monthly basis. And germ concern is down, uh, you know, which of course equates to less cleaning, but these concerns are not necessarily going away. They're in the what, are, what we call quote unquote neutral mode, uh, meaning that uh, anytime there is going to be new news on uh, people sneezing, like cold and flu season coming on, or uh, new uh, types of pandemics like monkeypox was in the news, people mm -hmm. will probably run to stockpile again or use the items more frequently. And we do track cold and flu statistics, for example, um, uh, which uh, originates in Australia a few months before the US. So we know that the levels this year will be elevated and therefore germ concern will continue to be top of mind for many. And uh, number one germ concern that people have is still at home, 40% or so people believe so. And it has remained this way for the last couple of months straight with people being again more homebound, they will still continue to cook and clean and so forth. And just one more important point that I want to make is the subject of stockpiling, which everybody, of course, thinks about. So people still do stockpile. Uh, however, it is down as people are shedding some of the hoarded items, particularly because inventory on shelf is now more stable and partially because they're now making trade-offs in their baskets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's important, you mentioned Australia being ahead of us, so their cold and flu season comes um, much earlier. I hadn't even thought about that. So uh, thanks for raising that. Um, you mentioned monkeypox, though. So what are you hearing about monkeypox and others and how consumers are responding? Uh, so we already um, are much more aware, of course, of endemics and pandemics. Apparently, mm -hmm. they have always been there. They have always been in the background, except that COVID really amplified the awareness of the health dangers and the need that people need, have to protect themselves, to put their overall personal shield uh, in our, uh, their clothing, in their you know, overall disinfection and cleaning, which puts them arguably in the driver's seat in control of their health. So the headline, I would say, is that cleaning and disinfection uh, and staying hygienic is here to Day, it's now much more mainstream instead of seasonal. So regardless of any one particular pandemic uh, that we are calling out, people are just going to be so much more proactive in uh, cleaning and again, protecting themselves from the outside world. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So obviously with, you know, with swine flu back in the day and then with SARS, we were kind of like spot cleaning in a way and it kind of died off again i wonder if this is now kind of back just here to stay like actually this is going to continue to happen we need to stay uh, um uh, very hygienic at all times <laughs> so a fun question that i always love to ask um 
are there any trends this year that either of you are saying that's kind of really surprising you? Um, and Pearl would love to kind of hear from you on any surprise consumer trends. Yeah, I think, uh, so there's a couple of them. Uh, one being how much engagement uh, with the US pop there is in gaming and the metaverse. So I recently read that 60% of the US pop considers themselves gamers and 90% of Gen Z, and it shocked me. And I sat and thought about it for a little bit, and I was like, well, I literally yell at my nine-year-old son every day about watching YouTube videos of grown men playing video games. So I was curious about some of the content he was watching. And so I, I just was jaw dropped to see how many subscribers there were to some of these like sites of just people playing video games and that they're all millionaires now. Um, so it just people play games. So they're yes. not just necessarily playing Literally games. Literally people they're playing video games. games, yes. So, and it's got an incredible following. So it really wow. further emphasized to me the importance of having highly engaged visual content, but also how much right now people really enjoy augmented reality. So the gaming was one thing that kind of surprised me just in terms of how much adoption there was. The other um, trends that we've seen, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily surprising, but there's a little bit of a post polarizing trend in beauty. Uh, one referred to as the lipstick effect, and the lipstick effect was named in 1998 after doing research on previous recessions. And what they found was there was about a 48% uptick in lip care during the recession. So it's become an indicator that a recession is happening. So um, really what it is, is a way for women to indulge in products and discretionary spend products as a way to combat what's happening in the economy. So really the moral there to me was that discretionary spend is so personal and it's really unique to every individual. And we also see, as I mentioned, it's polarizing. We also see some downstreaming, right? It's just cost driven, right? You can't pay for those premium high end products anymore. So again, it's largely going to be income driven, have and have nots kind of thing. So. I would say those are the, some of the trends that have surprised me today. Yeah, and that lipstick trend is also um, happens during wartime recessions as well. World War One, yeah. World War Two is yeah. all lipstick as well. Um, and you mentioned that kind of down trading. I, I previously worked at uh, uh, Mintel, and I was actually in the beauty and personal care team in 2008, where we saw people were no longer buying um, kind of high end clothing or handbags, and therefore they had that available cash to spend on that Chanel lipstick, whereas they were trading up on their lipstick uh, brand choices as well. Yelena, did you see any uh, interesting uh, trends over the last year? Yeah, absolutely. So everybody is always talking about private label and how shoppers are trading down to private label. Yet what has been interesting is that a private label actually, as reported by you know several you know sources, has actually been quite stable. Uh, the share overall of private label has remained flat at about 18%. It hasn't really shifted that much. I mean, certain categories, absolutely, especially in grocery. But when it comes to more of the uh, traditional, uh, you know, merchant, you know, merchandising type types of uh, categories. Um, not so much. We have seen people trading down to maybe the good and better versus best in some instances uh, tiers, but within the same brands. So we're not necessarily having people trade out entirely. In fact, I would say that many go after the uh, behavior uh, that can be described as we're too frugal to buy cheap things because people still want efficacy. They still want uh, the confidence that the product is working. And because they're at home, much more, they actually can witness which products are working better or not. And uh, the Mucinex and Airborne, which are some of our brands, for example, are not going away anytime soon, for example. In fact, shoppers are leaning into them, even the uh, what we call have-nots are leaning into some of these brands. And the other thing I would say that has been interesting is the usage of coupons, especially on the things that people think could be technically discretionary, but they absolutely do not want to trade out of those categories like air care, uh, because it's uh, the simple indulgence, almost uh, a little bit reminiscent of the lipstick effect that Pearl alluded to, that people still want to enjoy as they continue to cocoon inside of their homes. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I know you mentioned um, a quote the other day that people are too too frugal to buy cheap things. So especially for cleaning products in particular, I'm like, I'm going to buy the best because I don't want to have to use double the amount to clean my kitchen. Um, so definitely I love that phrase kind of too frugal to buy cheap um, is key too. Um, so focusing on how do you start to predict these trends and what types of predictive models are you using um, to unlock some of those consumer trends and a question from the audience also was kind of what tools are you using to, to track consumers and Yelena will will ask you there. So it, it seems like there are actually two questions here in one. So I will first describe more of how do we predict the future. So clearly nobody has the crystal ball. And as much as we'd love to tap into Mintelli and your monitor, you know, they themselves are only predicting their own model. So we uh, typically would consider scenario planning. And I think that anytime you speak to the cantars of the world and, you know, some other key uh, vendors, they would be the ones who would suggest, you know, that approach. So you have to to pick the attributes or the you know drivers of change that you feel will impact your categories the most you know in some instances it could be demographic change or you know the social change it could be the economics or the COVID severity so once you pick your key drivers of change you have to map them right and almost create the scenario so I'll give you an example what if you were to map the economic severity for example from strong economy to weak economy Economy. What mm -hmm. if you were to overlay that with lots of, you know, a very severe COVID or a cold and flu or, you know, whatever it could be in our world and less severe? And you very quickly get the quadrants, right? You play out these very specific scenarios and then try to think through what does that mean to your categories? What does it mean to your retailers? What does it mean to your shoppers who are haves or have nots? And that way you're actually prepared to anticipate what can happen. And mm -hmm. once you know what those scenarios are, you can then start to read the tea leaves of what are the indicators, right, or the anchors of certain scenarios that you're starting to observe. So therefore, you can start to anticipate some of these scenarios playing out. And if you have a plan, then it feels like you are just being smart in reacting. But in reality, you probably have done a lot of homework to be able to get there. So that's your question number one. Yep. <laughs> and then I guess question number two was how do we track what is happening? How do we track so that we can read the tea leaves? Yep. So uh, in a way, um, the time of one and done studies are, is over. You know, those big clunky studies that we could do and then milk for the next five years that cannot happen anymore because our reality is just changing so quickly. And is that hockey puck effect of all the things that are happening at once. And again, so dramatically fast. So the only way that you can track it accurately is to have longitudinal way of tracking shopper behavior monthly. You can do it by a social listening. You can do it by a questions and answers through Susie, which we absolutely love to do and dive and double click into individual questions. You can do it with the video metrics where you track shoppers behaviors when they self videotape themselves um, and so forth. So there are many different tools, but I would say that you have to be on top of it, which escalates the amount of work. Uh, there is definitely much more than the one of study, but it is so worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so changing track ever so slightly there, how does social media have an impact on the trends in your categories? So we we you know, briefly mentioned um, TikTok there, but speaking of, kind of share of stomach and um, share of shopper basket, share of people's attention um, is obviously also key as well. We recently saw that Netflix um, had had a, a decline in the amount of minutes, I believe, on TikTok is now up to 90 minutes per day. So we'd love to hear from you, Pearl, kind of how is social media and TikTok having an impact on your category? Great. Yeah, social media has a tremendous impact, particularly when it comes to beauty and cosmetics. So if you take a look at these TikToks, I mean, beauty talk, skin talk, hair talk, you name it. Um, when you have really viral engaging content and the right influencers endorsing more, not, not paid endorsements, but really organic and truly, you see an immediate impact in sales. Um, if there's any Real Housewives fans out there, it's one of my guilty pleasures, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, Bethany Frankel, she was on Real Housewives of New York. Um, she also has Skinny Girl Margarita. She's a millionaire, but she recently created a viral following around um, 
products where she's taking her really high end premium products and comparing them to drugstore and Dollar General and Dollar Tree items that she finds in the stores for, you know, under a dollar, under five dollars and doing an online comparison, you see immediately a spike happen in those sales. So um, it's really tremendous what social media can do. Um, in addition to that, we've seen products that aren't intended for certain uses from different categories named hashtag beauty hacks. Um, and as soon as they're put out there, oh my gosh, talk about innovating and thinking differently about how we do innovation. I mean, really, it's all social media driven. It's not through our traditional forms of media. So I would say it's where the future is going. I, I mean, it's not even where the future is going. It's where it is now. And it's just, you know, that that stat, Katie, around, you know, TikTok time spent. I mean, it's just incredible how fast it's changing. Yeah. Yeah, it really has. Um, and even as we were looking at the back to school trends of last week, um, one of the the biggest trends is, ha or the biggest hashtag, sorry, is, is hashtag ninth grade um, makeup. So it's yeah. even more yeah. niche <laughs> to that level as well. Um, so as it pertains to kind of using insights, one trend we're seeing more and more um, at Suzy is that organizations need to really be able to like dig deeper and deeper into their insights. Um, so how have you changed the way that you actually talk to consumers in recent years? And are you using any kind of new insights methodologies? Yelena, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. So um, I think that uh, a couple of things that I had already mentioned a little bit, I will go deeper into. Uh, we definitely are doing many more uh, longitudinal types of surveys. And we are using now the technology to really embrace how quickly we can get to the shoppers, really. And you know, whereas before, you know, the luxury of, uh, you know, and I'm going back 10 years now, quantitative, you know, could take six months to turn around. Now it's six minutes. It literally is that fast when it comes to certain questions and answers. So again, Susie, when we sent out our questions to the field and get shoppers to respond instantaneously, really, and now we get it over the weekend. So when people are relaxing, we're collecting our data. Sometimes I need a couple of uh, quotes for a customer call and we literally put out via Vox Pop me a couple of questions online and I have them within an hour and I can create my own quick uh, video uh, in a matter of seconds which actually goes quite representative to really provide that why and that qualitative value behind the numbers that we already seen in scan data or in panel. So technology is definitely key here and being super efficient with it and connecting the dots between the technologies and between the methodologies is really what I think differentiates a really strong Sharp Insights manager from somebody who may not be as uh, creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know that we've talked before about really tapping into those vendor relationships that you have for, for a lot of extra value um, as well. A lot of us have come from um, other companies or we have a lot of industry expertise too. So definitely my advice is your teams at Suzy and all of your other vendors are definitely here to, to help you along the way as well. Um, and so you mentioned kind of qual there and obviously video is vital. Um, how, you, how are you using qual and quant methodologies and pulling them together to tell those stories? So uh, qual can come in many different ways. And again, technology has been really helpful. Qual continues to be perfect for in-person you know, groups for uh, one-on-ones, but we also have now started to do qual online in virtual focus groups which by the way is fantastic because your buyers can dial in from pretty much any a location without the commitment of travel uh, we also mine a lot of videos uh, where shoppers just self submit one minute videos for example and again you can be very very creative in asking questions as long as the question is objective so really quantitative provides the numbers, but qualitative provides so much more of the richness of the why. And it allows you to really read between the lines and understand the general mood of what people are saying. And you can put so much more emotion and humanity into the data, which again, we all could absolutely benefit from because we're moving so quickly, but it's that emotional and personal connection that makes all the difference in our world. 
Yeah, absolutely. It really reminds me of um, uh, when I was at university and shortly after, there was definitely this kind of separation of like the qualities and the quantities and very different practices. I'd love seeing those come closer and closer and closer together. And almost all the projects we run at Suzy now are qual and quant hybrid for sure, which is a really great trend I've seen. Um, we are also hearing kind of some different stories from our clients related to everyone's favorite word budgets uh, some some have actually increased some have decreased um but honestly the majority of what i'm hearing from clients is that most budgets have just stayed flat despite inflation um so are you being asked to do more with less and how are you navigating that and pearl we'll start with you yeah i would say right now whether it's personally or professionally everybody's working through budgets right now um so whether you're budgeting for your family or in the workplace it's really uh focusing on how do you maximize that budget and so i think it's really important to stay immersed through a lot of the content that's out there that's even free through vendors and even if you go to a lot of the supplier insights podcasts youtube videos industry articles um, you can really elevate just understanding what's happening real world and real time. Um, so we all know in our industry, time is really a currency for us, right? So it's getting to the insights fast, but also being able to pivot and be agile because so much is changing so quickly. So I would say, you know, really focus on the tools that have the ability to do that. And that's actually why we love Susie so much, right? It's, as Yelena mentioned, I can run a survey over the weekend and have my answers in the inbox on Monday morning. I mean, there's nothing like that. So um, I would say when it comes to budgeting overall, it's, you know, we're, we always do relentless prioritization, but really paying attention to those tools that give you the ability to be real time and get you to the insights fast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what are, what are your thoughts, Yelena? Um, I would agree. I think that uh, uh, sometimes it's not about the budget itself. It's about the quality that you are driving and the value that you are able to extract. So I think everybody without a say will say, we don't have enough people to do the work that is being asked. Or we don't have enough resources. But the truth be told is when you evaluate your contracts with your vendors, two things need to happen. First of all, build the best teams with your vendors. The vendor, I don't like the word vendor because it makes it sound so impersonal. Uh, our uh, teams that support us on the vendor side are the natural extension of our teams. We cultivate them, we select them, we ask that certain people remain to support us because they understand our culture, our expectations. They start to over time learn our categories. So they become a natural value add. We do ask them for ideas, we do ask them for questions. And the more they know, the more creative and efficient they can be. That's point number one. Point number two is uh, when you actually reevaluate your contracts, you will see that there are a lot of hidden values that probably are not being maximized. For example, you might actually have built in consulting hours. You might have built in, um, you know, decks that your vendor can build for you on your behalf. And you should ask them to do that because, again, as Pearl said, time is our currency and everybody is, you know, you know, it's very scarce. But if you can really rely on your vendors as a natural extension of your team and have them double click on certain things and topics that you do not have time to get to, uh, two plus two starts to equal five. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, it's so true. And we um, being on uh, on our side. Um, yeah, vendor, not a fan of the word, but we can use it. Um, same thing, we love to find out about the category. I recently actually had a, a client in the dairy space who shared an entire kind of category report. It was about an hour long phone call. Like, we are now so much more knowledgeable about what their challenges are, et cetera, that now we can start to pivot and provide um, you know, much better guidance. So definitely take advantage of those relationships. We, we love it too. We, we wanna get smarter about our clients' challenges and, and categories. And thinking about kind of more creative ways, um, are there kind of like other creative ways that you're uncovering insights? Yeah, Elena, uh, so yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so um, from the, uh, I guess, the the interesting part about the creativity is that sometimes actually uh, pe what people don't realize is that 
um, many times people rotate out of roles in the matter of two to three years. The advantage of uh, being in Shopper Insights is you actually have a luxury of staying longer, which makes you the resident in-house librarian to some ways and makes you actually remember what research you may have done in the past. So one of the ways that people leave value on the table is by just looking forward and doing new research without uh, really comparing it to some of the research you have done in the past. How has the category evolved? What have you learned? Are the tests that you're running for planograms now uh, as relevant, you know, or have they been done before? What have you learned? Uh, how can you take some of these new methodologies and learnings from the past? How do you connect the dots to say the so what and create something completely new and visual into the future? So it's more of that creativity that I think separates, you know, companies and teams and even Shopper Insights X experts. It's not just the ability to run research or to read the data or to even say this is the most actionable insight. It's actually taking that actionable insight and saying, therefore, this is what that action should be. And so now the stakes in our profession are just so much higher, but also it's just so much more fun if you really embrace it. Yeah, absolutely. And I would just quickly add um, to Yelena, like, I, I think, um, now more than ever, just giving, you know, what the environment is like both in store and online. I mean, we're going to have some cocooning, but I would say just continually get out to retail and not your just traditional retailers and to see what they're doing, what's out there. Um, so, for example, it's like we don't go to the customers we just you know, call on. We go out of the box and go to the progressive and really changing ones. I think that's a way to really kind of understand and have your pulse on what's happening on the people. And then with cocooning happening, Yelena, I think with people at home, I mean, comb these sites, follow these influencers, understand and really have a pulse on what shoppers are really doing. I think it's incredibly important right now to understand that before you even execute any research. So I would just add that there. Yeah, definitely. Getting into store is so vital. My very first um, role in my career was at a food and beverage company and I would um, do the kind of in-store walkthrough and I'd go to everything. I was in the UK, everything from kind of the high-end Waitrose and Marks and Spencers through to kind of Tesco and Sainsbury's. And it was so vital just to see what would that journey of me picking up my, my company's product was Italian cheeses and so on. But what is that journey in the store versus the store and just becoming a consumer in those stores? Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, following those influencers, bake the product um, that, your, yeah. that your ingredient goes into um, and so on. Um, and then we talked a couple um, uh, moments ago also about kind of the different TED Talks and podcasts that are out there. I have some um, personal favorites. Well, true crime is my real passion. Um, but as it pertains to kind of getting smarter, Professor Galloway has a great podcast with Cara Swisher, the Pivot Podcast. There's Morning Brew. There's Plain English. Are there other kind of podcasts and TED Talks that you recommend for the audience? Elena, I know you mentioned a couple of TED Talks uh, um, that, that you have shared with your team in the past to help motivate them. Absolutely. Uh, yes, that's probably one of my professional guilty pleasures is the TED Talks and uh, a couple of, you know, speakers, you know, Simon Sinek, for example. But I think that the key is um, with me managing the team and also uh, dotted line managing other people and inspiring people to use the insights, I need to motivate myself to be able to motivate others. And so I think for us, sometimes it's even a bigger responsibility to be able to really be the beacon of energy that really rallies the troops to be even more creative and inspire them with the results that they deliver, but may not be even giving themselves the um, credit for. So I think to me, some, some of that is uh, really, really critical. And then always stay curious and uh, look at and listen to podcasts from the key vendors. You know, again, we spoke about how they can be adding value and they have been. Uh, the industry now has so many tremendous webinars and podcasts and, uh, you know, you could be doing your own dishes and still listening to something, but you have to be on top of it all the time because again things change monthly shoppers sentiment changes monthly but don't just look at the very specific measures such as covid rates or inflation rates or what the gas price is look at things that are more relevant for that time of the year what is happening with the labor day sales now what is happening with back to school how is halloween coming in and 
what is the shortage of candy going to do to people trick-or-treating and how they will protect themselves, for example, uh, and then how does that trickle into the holiday season and so forth. So all these things are more relevant than ever and there is no new normal or at least it hasn't stabilized. So we're the ones creating the future, which is the only way we can predict it. Yeah, absolutely. I would just add to Yelena, just around kind of your uh, self-care. Self-care is actually one of the biggest trending things that's happening right now. So this is more on a personal level, but John Bilyeu, who did some YouTube um, videos on maximizing your performance, right? Maximizing your performance in the workplace. I think those are all incredibly important during this time. So I love those, highly recommend. Um, and then on a personal level, smart list, if you just kind of want to disengage a little bit, it's really funny. It's a podcast. Um, so I just say in general, it's all around things that help you balance, right? Because we all have the industry and we're inundated with so much content right now that it's really focusing on things that can help you maximize you and your team out there in the workforce. Definitely, yeah. And Pearl, it's like a great point you make, you make on kind of well-being. I listen to a podcast about sleep and now I keep advising my team. I'm like, make sure you get eight hours of sleep. He's yeah. going to bed early tonight. You'll feel so much better and be more productive tomorrow. Everybody go to bed early. It's like my new favorite tip. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's start kind of looking ahead. Pearl, the last time you and I spoke, um, we uh, we talked about where you see category management and shopper insights heading in the next couple of years. So I'm curious how you'd answer that same question today. Yeah, I, I think when we spoke in March, I talked a lot about uh, predictive analytics, data automation, data science. I still think that's the future for sure. Um, what I'll add today is algorithm driven selling and algorithm driven commerce, right? So if you think about all the content that's being captured from us personally through every click, every view, there's gonna be a lot of personalization moving in the future. So category management will definitely do different. And um, what I wanna reemphasize though is that with all the data that's out there um, and this really high focus on data science, I think now more than ever, it's important to have um, us in our industry who could be translators of that data. So it's one thing to produce all these reports very quickly and, and fast in real time. And it's another thing and a whole other skill set to curate that content into tangible insights. So I think um, it's an incredibly important resource for any team. Um, so I would just say in general, like I, I see the future as very exciting, changing very quickly, but again, just really driven on the new ways people are shopping and again that data science framework yeah absolutely and elena i know that you and i in the past have talked a little bit about how do we hire for these people and backfill them what are your thoughts Mm. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, a, a couple of things. I just want to add a little bit to what Pearl was saying that the only thing that is certain is uncertainty. But I just want to uh, like add a couple of other you know ideas that sort of uh, crossed my mind is because there is so much changing. Uh, people do have sometimes the tendency to say, "Oh, not again." It's another thing that is thrown into the pile. But uh, our experience is so much more of a journey. And I think that because we're such curious people enjoying it and just embracing it will change your productivity and the outlook to this role and therefore to you know how you hire, how you groom your team members. And probably the first thing I would say is do not react. Try to be more proactive about life, uh, about what you do try to anticipate what questions will come up and try to structure your you know service with Susie or your you know quick studies in such a way that you have the information and the answer before people know to go to you and ask the question because once they do and believe me they will do you will come across as so much more prepared and so much more on top of it so as a result when you hire people hire people who are curious Hire people who are not just the numbers people who can analyze or run dry research. Hire people who are creative in how they know to ask the question. 
how they can ask the question in a more creative way, and how can they connect the dots of which methodologies to use in combination, and also how to draw the so what. So if you have an insight of uh, an amazing display that depicts a solution, have them uh, be motivated to go to the design agency and say, uh, this is what I want, and sketch it on a napkin right and still be able to connect those dots so in a way people who have category management experience are invaluable people who come from the agency side or from the vendor side are so much more hungry to be creative and to embrace it and finally it's people who can make sure that their amazing work that they're proud of is not just getting placed on the shelf try yeah. to drive as much uh, roi on your research and your knowledge as possible through the entire organization go and talk to marketing go and talk to sales go talk to category go talk to your research people or research and development people go and talk to anybody who would listen because they will find value through their own filter and this is how you become indispensable and while directional you might not generate an extra dollar indirectly you might generate 200 absolutely yeah and that goes for every company even at Susie, we use um, a tool that, that records our, our client calls and every time i hear like a really interesting nugget i'm like talking to the product team and the marketing team and r d i'm like listen to what the client said it's so in, so insightful and i try and evangelize uh that voice of the customer um even for us every day as well so we're coming up a little bit on time so finally what advice do we have for our audience as we gear up towards that end of year shopping we've got the holidays coming we've got cold and flu season um pearl let's start with you what advice do you have for the audience yeah i would say in general and um, i think Yelena mentioned about tracking what's happening in australia with this upcoming season and um Unfortunately, I don't want to be bearer of this news, but they are calling for what they're calling a twindemic, right? Which is a combination of a high incidence of the flu mixed with COVID spikes. So I would say as long as your budget allows to prepare as much as you can, if you have the means to, but don't overdo it. Don't freak out. Um, don't hoard. I mean, we don't know. We're never going to really know, but I just say in general and then enjoy like I said, I'm, I'm waiting, Katie, too, for that pumpkin and that like, whatever. So, so, you know, enjoy those small indulgences that bring you big joy. Absolutely. Any final words of advice, uh, Yelena? Sure. So, um, again, continue to stay curious. Continue to ask questions before somebody else thinks to ask them and do the research as a result. Um, uh, I think this is the time of change and to be excited and please continue to empower your shoppers so that they feel like they're still in control of their life in spite of all the things that they do not have the control over but do the same thing with each other in your teams and give them the power to run their own research to ideate and be creative because uh right now things need to they should be disrupted they should be unlike you know anything we've done before you know think of unthinkable you know do things that you never thought were possible you know be more bold be more gutsy and this is the time to do things in a unique way to prepare for when the times get a little bit more stable yep excellent right well thank you both so much it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you this afternoon I am going to pass back to Jackie, who's going to wrap us up for the day. Yes, thank you, ladies, for such a uh, helpful conversation on not only some real-time category management shopper insights things going on, but I loved your question on the future of kind of the profession and the industry, and those were some great tips, I think, for the audience to, to be thinking about as machine learning comes into the space, as we have to be more agile with our research, et cetera. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today on a Friday. As a reminder, we will post the replay in our resource library for all CMA and SEMA members uh, to revisit early next Next week and we will send you all an email when that gets posted and with that we will close out everyone have a great uh great weekend thanks everyone bye everyone